Welcome, everybody. My name is Tommy Soares. I'm Assistant Director of the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology, and Infectious Disease. And today on Pathfinder, I have the pleasure of welcoming Dr. Nathan Horn, who is Senior Scientist at United Animal Health. Thank you, Nathan, for taking time to talk to us today and tell us a little bit about your journey. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity uh, to be part of this. Well, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. I know you have a very focused background uh, in animal sciences, animal health, and you seem to have been almost laser focused right from the beginning of your career. And I'm so interested in hearing some of that journey because I haven't been laser focused. I've been, you know, here and there. I probably still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. And like many of the listeners, there is that type of, you know, uncertainty. And it's admirable to see somebody who's been so determined and has so much uh, focus and determination to continue succeeding in, in this career path. So uh, fascinated. I would love to hear your story from the beginning, if you could take us back and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, that sounds great. And um, I you know appreciate all those uh, uh, kind words. And I think a lot of the, the common theme will be, um, you know, focusing on what, what I enjoy, what I thought I was good at, and also really having some really good mentors particularly starting out at Purdue. Um, and then, you know, previously with my, uh, uh, my family before that. Um, so I started out as an undergraduate at Purdue um, with intentions of going to veterinary school. And I'm not going to tell you the dates, but it was a long time ago. Um, so you, you can't date, uh, you can't date me, but um, in terms of my age, um, but it started out um, as an undergraduate. Um, uh, we did really well in animal sciences, had a deg uh, dual degree in animal science and biological science. And when I was um, a junior um, in animal sciences, I was took an opportunity to do some research uh, with um, Dr. Susan Eicher, who's now retired at the USDA. And she took a, took a chance on me uh, with a summer project and I thoroughly enjoyed it. the research project with was with beak trimming and and animal behavior. And although the exact science, the topic was not where I my passion was, I really just thoroughly enjoyed the science. And that's where I got hooked. And I stayed at the USDA as a technician or a, a research associate until I finished my um, my undergraduate degree, had the opportunity to go to vet school. And uh, Dr. Adiola recruited me. Um, my senior year to come to graduate school. And he told me all the great things about graduate school or veterinary school. And, he, and I enjoyed research as well. So there were some intangible and tangible benefits. So started a master's degree with Dr. Adiola in animal science. And our focus was on nutrition and uh, gastrointestinal function and actually in chickens and ducks. We looked at the amino acid of threonine and its role on GI function. And at that time, um, it was relatively novel, but now it's better understood that, you know, threonine is very critical. Threonine nutrition is very critical to having appropriate gut function, especially when there's a, an intestinal uh, stressor that causes inflammation, you know, such as E. coli mm -hmm. um, and a lot of livestock and poultry species. So anyways, completed my master's degree um, and I would needed a change. So I had been at Purdue for eight years as a student needed a little bit of a change. I thought I was kind of done with academia and uh, took an opportunity as a research associate at, Uni at that time it was called um, JBS United, now the company United Animal Health. And I worked in that position with uh, Dr. Ronnie Moser, Dr. Joel Spencer um, for about four years. And I it was a just a great experience. Um, I knew it wasn't where I wanted to be for my whole career, but it was just a great experience as a research associate because I really got to understand the nuts and bolts of applied research. Um, I worked with poultry, nursery pigs, all different stages of, you know, swine production and, um, you know, got to, you know, like I said, got to learn the nuts and bolts. Okay, protocol, report, statistics and communication and how critical that and that that type of role communication between the research farms and research scientists. Yeah. Um, 
but nonetheless, um, after about four years, I knew that I wanted to know more and do something, uh, you know, do more. And, um, and so I took an opportunity to come back to Purdue um, with Dr. Adiola and Dr. Ajuan um, to pursue my PhD. My PhD was on stress physiology and um, bio, um, garlic derived bioactives. Mm-hmm. Also worked part time as well. Um, so that was a really unique experience. I worked part time focusing on mycotoxin related tech service at United um, because I had a young family, a very young family, and I needed the income. So, uh, so I retained that part-time employment and that was good because it helped keep me focused. And, and in retrospect, I'm very thankful that I waited to go back to get my PhD because my maturity level was much different. Um, and I really appreciated the educational process more so than I ever had during my bachelor's and uh, master's. So after, um, my PhD, um, came back to United Animal Health and worked as a, what I'd say probably be a classical animal nutritionist role, focusing on nursery pigs. Nursery pigs have kind of been the theme throughout my whole career, um, with a few, you know, exceptions here and there, um, and was in that role for about two and a half to three years. And there was an opportunity to um, work with a company that was very close with United Animal Health, and was owned by a good friend of mine, Dr. Guy Miller, and the company was Biomatrix. Um, and I, so I transitioned over to a leadership role and that was very different, um, because I had never had any formal training in management. Um, and so I had a little bit of baptism by fire there and, um, a small business, 15 people. So a very different dynamic. And I thoroughly enjoyed that, you know, but as that company matured, guys no longer with us. Um, and there were some changes in ownership and, uh, you know, the company was going in a little bit different direction. And at the same time, there was a unique opportunity for me to come back to the mothership at United Animal Health um, as a scientist. And so I did that after about three years, was in that role as a scientist, general staff scientist. And I mainly provided um, scientific support for sales agency, um, Anatech and a subsidiary company of ours, Pivotal Ingredients on a, a product that's high in um, immunological bioactives. That's my primary focus. And then also, um, you know, provided scientific due diligence wherever I was needed. Um, that role matured into my current role as senior scientist, which is really new. So um, new for myself and new for the company as well to have an individual like that. So i um, still trying to figure that out, but I think what that, what, what it's going to entail will be um, more mentoring of um, some newer scientists. And, um, you know, our one of our company's core values is to win with science. And, and so one of our focus areas is to use non-traditional models to screen, you know, different ideas, products, concepts. And so that'll be a major focus of the molecular nutrition team, which I lead. Um, we'll be um, using cell culture models, um, unique in vivo models that are maybe non-traditional for at least animal agriculture. So, um, and that's, here I am now. So that's kind of a, a, a quick uh, synopsis of the journey. That's great. That's fantastic. And it sounds like uh, so quick and easy, but I'm sure there in the trajectory, there were ups and downs and, you know, they, I, I want to, I, I, I think you mentioned that, it's something that really struck a chord with me, which I've heard it before from other people. And it's this period of time before going back to academia that you spent in industry. Tell us a little bit more about that. And what, what, what were some of the things, and you talk about the communication piece as being very significant. Well, what was it that you took from that that maybe helped you succeed afterwards, but also maybe helped you succeed better uh, or focus better in what you wanted to do back in academia? Yeah, no, um, I definitely appreciate that. And I would say, you know, it's not the easiest path. And so I don't want to portray that by any means. Um, It is quite difficult when there is a break to go back um, cause you've got it as a change in habits. Yeah. And, um, that was a little bit of a challenge, you know, um, you know, getting back into the habit of an academic environment versus an industry environment, but it took about a year, got it figured out. Um, you know, I think, 
uh, there's a couple things, and uh, some of it's probably emotional intelligence or soft skill development um, with being able to communicate, know how to communicate, because I had experienced some pretty challenging situations, as we all do as young professionals, and it kind of worked through that. Um, and so I had kind of that perspective, um, but also the perspective of, um, you know, working on the farm, seeing problems. And I, what I saw too, was we had a lot of solutions, but we didn't know why they worked a lot of times, or we didn't really understand the problem we were trying to fix. And so that was the perspective that I saw, but I didn't really understand the big picture, you know, uh, or I understood the big picture, but wanted to know more about the details rather. And so I think that really helped guide the perspective. Um, and I think a, a couple of examples where I thoroughly enjoyed my courses when I was in my PhD, because I could see like, okay, in biochemistry, we're learning about this. And now that makes sense, you know, um, whereas before during my master's, I just didn't have that um, perspective. It's a lot about perspective, you know, so that would be, um, you know, one area. And the second area would be within my actual thesis. Um, and so one thing that's a really big issue with nursery pigs is once they're weaned, there's a lot of changes, stress, change, you know, diet, plus by bad luck, immunologically, they're compromised and they're prone to having an, an inflammatory response in the gut. And so we have a lot of solutions to fix that. But what I noticed was, okay, what does that stress actually cause? From just a very practical person, I'm not talking about you know, um, immunology, but what is that in terms of growth performance? Yeah. Um, in terms of intestinal morphology, and I couldn't really find any answers um, that were consistent. Now, there's a lot of good foundational efforts. I don't want to discount that, but there wasn't like a direct connection. You know, I, um, when pigs don't start well, this is what it translates into, and and that really guided um, the the um, you know my thesis work, which was um, to um, characterize what a poor starting pig looks like you know what does that mean from a growth performance perspective so then we have something to guide us when we want to determine does this concept work or does it not well you know now we have more definition there so those are two examples I think a lot of it just goes back to you know that having that perspective mm -hmm. and um mature just professional maturity as well I think you know um, and so when you were doing your PhD, you kind of knew that you were going to go back to work at uh, United Animal Health or what it, what it was before uh, BTS, is that right? Uh, JBS, JBS, United. JBS yeah. United. Yeah. Did you know that you were going to go back or did you did you have um, an inkling in the back of your mind, a dream to go back yeah, I'd always intended to, I, my, my dream was to come back as a nutritionist. Um, and one thing I just want to back up, I was really fortunate to have a really good support network with my wife um, that, you know, when I was in graduate school, Dr. Adiola and Dr. Ajwan were very accommodating in my situation. Yeah. Um, and then United, you know, was very, very accommodating. And part of that included funding as well. Right. So um, I, my dream was to come back as a nutritionist. Um, and, but I did have some formal agreements, which I think, um, you know, would be pretty standard. Um, and they, they you know, to where my, there was funding and in return, I was obligated to come back for a period of time to work for that employer. Um, but it wasn't, uh, you know, anything overly mil militant. It was very, a very workable, logical situation. And it was interesting that once I got into that role as nutritionist, I, like I was kind of like, well, this is really cool. I'm really fort I'm really appreciative to have the experience, but I enjoy maybe some of the more basic science a little bit better than I, you know, um, you know, thought I would. But yeah, so that's that was kind of the, yeah, that was the dream was to come back. Um, and ob obviously things changed. I went into a management role for a while. They came back into a scientist role. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and but just that you were able to point that thesis to a question that you had that was really meant to help you down the line as you stepped into that role back in industry. And I just find that that's so well put 
uh, why why write a thesis? A lot of us, you know, go into grad school thinking, well, okay, oh, you have to write a story about what we're doing here, about what you're doing. Okay, here's the thesis. But you went and before you even started any of that, you knew, okay, I, this is where I think I need to be uh, and where I'm going to be most prepared at the end of that thesis. And it wasn't a thesis just to write a piece of documentation, but you had you had application in mind. And uh, I think that that uh, is admirable that that you had that idea that you were going to be applying what you learned during your PhD. No, I appreciate that. And just for the record, we do use the model. We have used it um, at Biomatrix. We've used it at uh, United Animal Health. And um, in fact, we still use the model regularly. Now, it's not perfect, as a lot of things with animal science or the applied agricultural sciences are. Um, but it's I think most of us would gauge it's been helpful. Um, and hopefully one day there'll be another graduate student that can kind of pick up on there's a lot of gaps that still exist with that research model. Um, and so hopefully there'll be a graduate student that listens to this maybe or in the future that'll kind of help us answer some of those gaps to make it even better. Well, I mean, you brought it up and I'll I'll go there just because you brought it up. If, if you don't mind, you know, if you were a grad student today and you were thinking, OK, how can I best prepare to go speak to Nathan about this project? Because I think I can help with the modeling, add more layers, add machine learning, add whatever it might be that it would help you improve that, add microbiome information, all these other layers that you could potentially refine the model. What would they need to know? What would you want them to have as a skill set uh, even before they call you? I think just a general understanding of biology. Um, physiology would be helpful, but just a general understanding of biology um and statistics would be a good starting point or just general mathematical skills and chemistry so physiology or biology chemistry and mathematics those are the three i use them every day is that right time. oh that's yeah, awesome so, so to be be uh you know to have a good solid foundation there but they should by that point then i'd say the next step would be um go back and do a literature review just of a couple articles that have been published and um, take a very critical assessment of that. Um, you know, what's good? Okay, that's a small part of it. But what what did you not like or what were your concerns um, about that research? What are the gaps? And then, you know, bring that to, uh, you know, uh, a fruitful discussion of, you know, how those some of those gaps could be answered. Um, and then also, I mean, I would, you know, have having an applied perspective, having the bridging the gap between the applied perspective and the basic perspective perspective. So if there's parts maybe that a graduate student or potential graduate student is not familiar with, um, you know, maybe like, what is a nursery pig? And why this, why is this an issue? That's totally fine, right? That, but maybe do a little bit of homework to understand um, why is the nursery pig prone to having an overactive immune, uh, uh, innate immune system. Yep. Um, why why don't they eat well usually? And maybe doing a little bit of that homework, or at least to guide the questions, I think we'll have a, um, you know, a, a more um, fundamental understanding. I think that the key thing I would hope they would pick up on from specific to that research is why does a really acute stressor have really long term effects? And I think that's the big question. And so. Um, yeah, and that would be that that's the number one thing with that stress model. But just generally going through that process, um, the key thing being the um, critical assessment of the published literature. Yeah. And I think, you know, that example is probably relevant in, in what we people have had to deal with the pandemic and with this long term effects of having been infected with COVID. But now you have certain other health effects that that are, and and in a similar way i think people can connect with that and understand that you know what happens earlier on in the life of a pig can affect it as it's maturing as it's growing and then the quality of 
of the product, if we were to think of it that way, the quality of the animal at the end, the health of the animal is is impacted. So fascinating. I I, I think you know you 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 paint a very long term vision, as you said, for acute uh, attention that is required today. Um, Tell me something. Was it something about pigs, something about swine that attracted you from the beginning? Oh, yeah. So I'm sorry I forgot. to. I, I didn't go back far enough, I guess, but I have an agricultural background. Um, my I'm from a small family farm um, in central Indiana, and I was very active in 4-H and showing pigs, and pigs were always kind of my favorite. Um, so that's uh, kind of where it started. Yeah. And then, um, you know, the, I just kind of took the opportunities as they came. Um, yeah. and, and likewise, you kind of mentioned this, you're beginning, but that's why I'm, main reason I'm still, I mean, obviously I have an awesome employer. There's a great university here in Indiana that helped, um, with the education, but, um, agriculture is the main reason why I'm, you know, still in Indiana. So my family has a farm still, um, in central Indiana and we live in Rush County and my wife's family's farm and are very involved in agriculture still, not pigs, yeah. um, but other forms of agriculture, grain, cattle, and so forth. And I forgot to say, you know, uh, United Animal Health is in Sheridan, Indiana, right? And it's, uh, a, again, a, a, an, a, an area that if if you don't know about, uh, fairly outside of Noblesville, outside of uh, yeah, Indianapolis, Area, but again, I I think it, this connection with agriculture to Indiana is so important, is so relevant, uh, and it's an it's an opportunity to open up uh, potential career options that people didn't even know about. I mean, you're an animal scientist, uh, husbandry animal husbandry expert, uh, but tell us the other types of you know, positions that, that you, or, or roles, people, experts that you work with in your day-to-day, -day, if you can. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And I don't want, you know, certainly to send a message that, you know, you have to have a farming background or an animal husbandry background. I say, if you can get the experience, yeah. um, you know, and don't be afraid to get your hands dirty to get kind of what we call like the slat level um, experience and perspective. But there's really something for everybody in agriculture and it's, it's so technical and so science driven. Um, and I think that's maybe a perspective that's not understood by the general public. Just to give you some examples, um, you know, with, so I kind of chuckled a little bit when you said I'm applied because even though I do have applied experience, I don't get out on that segment very much anymore. And give you an examples of our team within our research group. So within the molecular nutrition group, um, we have a cell culture scientist. Um, he's trained, Dr. Hong Lu, he's trained as um, uh, an animal scientist, but we work um, with IPEC J2 cells, which are porcine cells as have been used mainly for human health side. Um, and we have MCF7 cells, um, which are breast cancer cells that we use for toxin screening. Um, we are working collaboratively with Purdue Food Science on an IPEC J1 um, cell line, which is for E. coli. So we use those types of cell culture models to screen concepts um, that are very difficult to practically screen um, in an animal like for E. coli or viruses in particular that can be really challenging and costly. So there's opportunities there. We have microbiologists within our team. Um, we have regulatory quality control. Um, and so it's not just about you know doing the classical agricultural studies that a lot of us would think about that honestly we kind of we've talked about you know um in this presentation there's a lot more to it and I really there's something that for everybody and I think the key message that's the key message from my end um and there's a really important place for you know especially as in it for innovators um you know to bring in some of these other models um, you know, some other areas that are interesting from my perspective, but we haven't just had the resources to focus on it yet at United would be, you know, to, um, you know, uh, incorporate some of the an engineering type perspective into our cell culture models or other ex vivo models to help with screening and real time measurements. So um, that's just a, a few examples of some of the stuff that we're doing beyond just the classical 
and you know agricultural type stuff yes and i i think i can help with that nathan i'm sure i can help with that uh make some of the connections here with the engineers at purdue um we've been talking to a lot of people one of them has talked to us about gut on a chip model uh which is you know microfluidics tied in with the microbiology and the cell culture and how do you how do you have and mimic potential uh, gut microflora micro uh, microdynamics if you want and physiology such a such an interesting interesting uh, area to to move forward in is that is that you think uh, a place where there's going to be most progress in your field. I think so. There's two areas that I think are going to really um, advance in our field with regards to cell culture. Um, you know, because we're using cell culture lines, MCF7 cells are have been around for a while. So they're still very helpful to us. But I think two areas would be the gut on the chip um, type um, model. Um, the other would be the use of heterogeneous cell lines, um, especially as we want to understand immunological or regular signaling interactions to where, you know, we can, um, you know, develop um, many guts um, that may be in a sphere or may be on um, a trans, you know, maybe uh, on a single layer, um, but or heterogeneous. So it gives, our, gives us a, a broader scope of understanding of what these compounds do before we go into the animal model. It's just a, a more efficient way, um, you know, of being able to improve faster. And, you know, for the benefit of the welfare of the animal, but also profitability and of the farmer. And then, you know, from the food safety aspect, there's kind of those three things that are that are involved there. And always we want to make sure our food is safe. So um, with with and mitigating some pathogen issues. But I think those are two areas, you know, I think um, really help us out. And that the other area is um, the applied aspect. So when we develop these models to ensure that we have a, a check, you know, okay, so we're seeing this in the cell culture model. Let's make sure we have the appropriate controls and go back um, to the applied uh, pig model or chicken model or rodent model or whatever, um, wh whatever it may be. And that's the one thing that we're really, we're really focusing on right now in our cell culture. And, you know, we've been successful is, okay, we have these two basic models. Let's link, let's show the link between the two so we can get a lot more out of those models and have confidence in our results. Yeah. You know, what's so amazing as you so eloquently put it is you're a basic scientist and the way you speak and the way you rationalize uh, is totally basic science. And I love that there is this uh, opportunity in a company for basic scientists like that. Um, you did talk somewhat about, you know, leaving Purdue after some time and getting that change, um, uh, that different perspective, but then coming back to, to Purdue, coming back to maybe some of the roots there. Um, as you, as you went back and forth, did you learn something new? Did you find what you wanted to get in terms of the different, different atmosphere, different perspective? And I'm sure it took some courage to say, well, I, I got to go. I, I, I got to go get a different view for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a work in progress, just like it is for all of us. Um, but, you know, one thing that I really appreciate about Purdue um, is with is the diversity and expertise and just diversity and experience. We have that at United Animal Health too, but on a uh, you know, and I really appreciate that within our team, but not at the level that a you know uh, an academic institution like Purdue would have. There's just so many resources available um, to help answer questions in a scientifically sound manner. Um, I mean that from people. That's the main thing is people, in my opinion, um, and their experiences, um, but also just, um, you know, equipment that's available um, across the university. 
um, and having a little bit more, uh, you know, academic freedom, you know, to pursue some stuff. So I think that's the one thing I, I appreciated as my PhD, coming back to my PhD. Um, but I, as I get more mature in my career, the, I appreciate, continue to appreciate more is just the general, um, the diversity and in, um, intellectual skills and experiences and how that could, you know, um, you know, just, it just makes, makes a pro process better. It can be a little frustrating when you got a lot of different people involved, but, um, it always makes the process uh, better at the end. Yeah. And, and tell us a little bit about this. You talked at the beginning about the communication, the importance of communication. It seems like you pick some of that up too, as you were moving through your trajectory. Can you tell us maybe, some guidance or what is it about that, that, that you, you think we should take uh, lessons from? Yeah. I think a lot of times when people talk about communication really with it's, uh, I think it probably always comes up right. Um, and good or bad. And I guess the first on the big picture, I'd say it's a lot of times listening, not talking. Right. So I think listening to what, you know, people say and like, okay, why do they have that perspective? Um, why are they saying that? Because um, sometimes how it may come out is not exactly what they mean and being able to kind of work through that, um, you know, based on your experience. So listening is a really um, important part of that. I think um, not being afraid um, to professional, been a very professional manner challenge um, and uh, ask why. Um, and that, just is something that comes along, I think, as, as an individual builds confidence in themselves. Um, so, you know, listening, asking why, those are really key things. And then knowing when to ask why and when not, when, you know, when to fight, pick your battle. Um, I think those are the, the three key things. But really the listening, I think, and then making sure people know that you're, you know, you're paying attention. Because um, I think when when individuals, people feel like they're listened to, they, there's trust that naturally comes along with that. So I think that would be, that would be my key, my key advice. Um, yeah. I may not always be the best listener, but I, I think that that's important. No, I agree with you 100%. Um, and it follows or it goes along with what you, again, said before, which is this piece on emotional intelligence that you you talked about picking up or at least recognizing that that is such a big um, aspect of allowing you to continue to succeed and make progress in your career. Tell us a little bit about what is emotional intelligence for you and how, 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 what, how do you pick up these skills if you can? Yeah, to me, it's, you know, kind of like we had mentioned before, um, you know, listening and understanding the perspective, um, knowing when to intervene with something, knowing when not to intervene with something, um, knowing when to ask why, uh, when not to ask why. And I think a lot of that comes with experience, particularly with making mistakes. People are going to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. And you can, as long as you learn from that, I think that's that's one thing. Um, and then also from a behavioral, I've never had any classical training in psychology or behavioral sciences, but I think observing trends and patterns and behavior, just like we observe trends and patterns and data, um, is helpful to developing emotional intelligence. And then there are um, a lot of assist, there's a lot of assistance out there, um, you know, for individuals. Uh, so I would encourage, it's not that I'm saying, uh, you know, even though I haven't had the opportunity um, necessarily to take um, official training. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of programs out there. I think that we, would be beneficial. Um, I did have um, some good coaching um, on on a you know, psychology based um, behavior system when I was at Biomatrix, which was uh, it just adds a degree of um, formality and understanding. Okay, why why do these behaviors work under these circumstances and why do they don't? But I think. You know, it kind of goes back to the listening perspective and, um, you know, just learning from mistakes or, and, and observing patterns of behavior. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And, and observing patterns in behavior is such a big way of learning, as you put it, because we can 
uh, not only observe good behaviors, we can observe bad behaviors. We can try to avoid those. If we could try to, you know, uh, uh, go towards the good ones. Um, are there any? Are there any uh, mentors? And you know, you've mentioned a few of the people that you've worked with, uh, and and would love to hear. You know, what are some of the token pieces of advice that you got from these uh, people as you were moving through and um, interacting with them? Yeah, I'd say, you know, from an academic perspective, um, uh, two key mentors of mine, um, there's lots of them. So I don't want to offend anybody because there's just been, I've been so fortunate to have just good people just help me throughout my whole career. Um, but in academia, Dr. Adiola would be, you know, a key one, Dr. Ajuan, and they're very different in their approach. Um, and, you know, Dr. Adiola is, I say the, the, the key attribute to Dr. Adiola is he's very genuine. Um, obviously he's extremely intelligent. Um, there's no doubt about that, but he's very genuine in how he communicates things and very direct. And that was a little bit of a shock to me as it is, I think all of his graduate students, um, but it's, you know, you realize you don't appreciate it at the time, but you come to appreciate it um, that, you know, calling people out when they're not doing their best, you know, is really big for him. And it makes people better because of it. Um, and it humbles people, too. Um, you know, I think that's a really important part of the process, too. So Dr. Adiola is just genuine. He's a genuine communicator. Um, Dr. Ajuan is just so supportive. Right. He's he always fosters good ideas. So having those two together as mentors, they're so different. Um, but it's, it was really, I was really fortunate, um, you know, and uh, thinking in the industry, Ronnie Moser, I'd say he's just a really good listener. Um, and uh, I've had some other good teachers as well. Dr. Guy Miller um, at Biomatrix. Um he just was my greatest advocate, right? So just a lot of very different uh, on the spectrum. But I think the key thing is um, just very mentors that are very genuine and want to bring them up with you and, you know, their careers. I, the, this is uh, so important. I And I hope people are hearing this uh, because as you said from Dr. Miller, he was your greatest advocate. Um, and it's almost like, you know, if we want to, if we want to continue to progress and succeed, not only do we need to find people who are our greatest advocates, but we also need to be advocates for the people that work with us. And that's a way of leadership. And it's probably one of the the best ways that I've heard anybody put it that way. Um, have you, how, how do we do this? How do, it takes, it takes a lot of empathy, right? It takes a lot of uh, thoughtfulness and, and being able to, to work with people. But what was it that you say, Dr. Miller, you know, how, what were the opportunities that he took to make sure that you were up in in the forefront and uh, speaking highly about you? Yeah, I think a lot of it was um, he was at a, a stage in his career, and I think we all, all should learn from this too. Uh, you know, he was not afraid to let the individual make a mistake, let me make a mistake, even though it could have hurt his financial interest a little bit. Uh, but he would have stepped in, I'm, I know for sure, if it would have been something really, really bad. But um, he was not afraid to let individuals kind of figure things out on their own. Um, and he was kind of, you know, there there to give advice. I'd say that would be, um, you know, one of, one of his uh, uh, key attributes. Um, and experience, too. Um, and, and, you know, it goes back to just a really good listener. Yeah. I don't know if that um, answers your question or not, but I think those are the, the it, key things that come up. Right it away. does. It does. And, you know, to a certain extent, you know, I, I think of ways that that some of my mentors have propped me up. Right. If there's an occasion for them to say, well, 
this this was done by Tommy or this was done by Nathan or you should really see this piece of work that Nathan did for us or whatever it might be. I mean, again, like we we are so easy to discredit our own value, discredit our own contributions. It's ah, it's this is just ah, whatever. This is just what I did. Um, and I think it's important to have people around us that can help us uh, do the self-reflection, uh, even if it's in a good way. Uh, and as you said, sometimes we need to be called out if we haven't been doing our best. And um, can you tell us a little bit about what was that approach? And you say he was very genuine. Uh that's a good thing. And it could also be shocking, right? If he's calling you out on like stuff that you were supposed to do or you forgot to do. Yeah. And just real quick going back, I'm sorry. I thought of one more thing. Yes. Um, uh, you know, for, for, uh, guy as he, um, he, he helped set me up. He gave me some easy wins as well to boost confidence. And so I think, you know, I always try to reflect on that is okay. This project. Yeah, I could do this. But is there a team member that, you know, could also do this and put their own creative spin on it to be successful? Mm -hmm. And he he did that very early in my career. And and just like Dr. Adiola did as well and others, um, they call me like, you know, you set people up for success uh, by, by and, and you don't know it at the time. But it, when you get older, you kind of reflect, you're like, yeah, they could have done that better, but they let me do it. Um, and it succeeded and it boosted my confidence. So um but yeah, getting back to, uh, you know, I think the genuine communicators, you know, and uh, genuine approach, um, you know, there were some, it was a bit of a culture shock for me going, you know, from undergraduate, uh, you know, when you're like a lot of us academic, academically at the top, you don't necessarily get feedback. You hear a lot of positive things. You don't necessarily get a lot of other constructive criticism. And when I went to graduate school, it was, it was a bit of a, a culture shock. Um, and so I think the classical example that I remember in mind, any, any graduate student that's been in that lab is going to listen to this and they're going to be laughing because we've all experienced this, but my first paper that I wrote, you know, um, and, uh, you know, I remember handing it over and, um, and he kind of looked at me and he said, you can do better. And he, but it, it was, it went beyond that. And he was right. I could, uh, and I, I'll never forget that experience because, I learned so much on that how to how to write and communicate in that first paper that and and that feeling frankly of embarrassment to um someone you look up to is something that no one ever wants to experience right so um and he was right and not only did he call me out on it but he also went through hours probably of his time which he didn't have to do of okay so this is wrong or this is not you know, the best way to do it. So here's an example of why. And, uh, you know, that approach went beyond just writing, but also with experimental design and uh, to the effect that, um, you know, we did our statistics by hand, right? Mm -hmm. We knew how to do all the formulations by hand. And that was just such a great teaching experience. And it really didn't, he didn't have to do that, right? He could have said, um, go to page 155 of statistical, your st stats textbook and figure it out yourself. But instead he took the time, you know, to actually go through and explain and, you know, and uh, it wasn't just like 15 minutes, it was hours upon hours of teaching. So, yeah. And I, I, people don't know a time before YouTube where you could, or the internet, right? You didn't have the internet at that time in the way that you do uh, now that is so full of information, full of resources. It had not caught up back then, I'm sure. And it it was it was not as accessible with YouTube learning things, right? Uh, that you can learn so much now. That is that is must have been uh, an an atmosphere to to be around. And and it seems also like you you commented on something that maybe keeps coming up as a theme is that we we learn so much from our mistakes and it's typically mistakes of you know our own 
uh, our own doing, lack of care, lack of interest, or whatever it might be, but to, as you said, to be sitting there and be somewhat ashamed of not having done your best to this person that you look up to and that uh, you're you're working with. I think there's so much to be said about the lessons that we do learn going through some of those difficult moments in in life, right? Yeah, and I, I just want to point out too, you know, Dr. Adiola, he'd also be the first to point out when you were successful and he would let everybody know that you were his graduate student, right? And that, you know, uh, it was you that did it. And um, so, you know, there was that, you know, balance that always existed. Um, yeah, but learning from mistakes, it's, it's okay to make a mistake as long as you learn from it. That's yeah. how I kind of look at it. But I'm sure you also learned the patience that it takes to really teach, the patience that it takes to go back through and almost through the basics of, you know, what is experimental design? I'm sure that first paper as you were going through it and how we should present it and what do we do? How do we talk about what and where? So it, it that that is, it's ad admirable uh, for you to speak of him uh, as such a great teacher, but uh, you know, it's, it's something that again, it's, it, it's a quality that um, if we can continue to take on uh, and pass on to the next generation is, is what it takes. Do you think these lessons have really helped you succeed? And I'm going to talk about succeed in your transition from animal husbandry to human workforce management and managing people that that as a senior scientist senior research scientist you're you're now having to confront yeah i think so i think a lot of it you know is the one on the art of the one-on-one -on -one communication um and refining those skills um being in those uncomfortable situations but also you know also recognizing the great you know the wins as well um, but I think having that, you know, the are the tech, technology is great. And I think without a doubt, we have to use it. We have to adapt. But um, I think if there's like a blend in my mind of like that art of that old school. Yeah, you're right. It, when, when I was in graduate school, we Internet was here, but it wasn't like, it, you know, it is now. So um, and having that art of the one on one communication coupled with technology um, you know, so how I, how I, you know, practically view that, okay, um, is this a team's message? Is this an email or is this a personal phone call or does this require me to, I don't work from the office. I work remote most of the time. This required me to drive to Sheridan and have a face-to-face -face conversation and not just bad, just, I mean, good stuff too, right? Yeah. There's some stuff that's so good that it, you know, it, you know, thinking through, okay, the message that sends by an individual traveling two hours to go to the office for a yeah. meeting yeah. to talk about something. And so I think that's kind of, that kind of refines, you know, your, your skill set in graduate school. No doubt, no doubt. And then even just the more, you know, as you start getting more and more involved and more, you, you seem to also have discovered this, um, more responsibility that comes with with participating um, as you went through some of that transition. I guess, you know, what's the what's it like working at United Animal Health? Tell us a little bit about, you know, what's your day to day? If, if somebody were looking at you and said, boy, I, I really wish I could do what he does. What what is it that that you do day to day? What are the things that you like? What are the things that you don't like? Day-to-day -day is different every day. So if you enjoy that, then it's a great, uh, you know, um, if you enjoy doing something different, um, if you enjoy not a lot of structure, um, not saying, you know, United doesn't have structure, but the culture is to let people kind of find their own way as long as we're all on the same ship looking in the same direction. Everybody can kind of be, you know, charting their own, uh, you know, to, as long as we're meeting the same goals. And so um, not a lot of structure um, and very different. And when I mean different, I mean, 
Um, one day it might be molecular biology. The next day it may be collecting fecal samples at the farm. And I think like mentally, that's the most rewarding thing for me. Oh, and then, you know, working with people, uh, managing and mentoring and things like that. So to me, that like uses different parts of my brain and it's very refreshing, um, you know, uh, doing literature reviews. So it's very variable um, based on goals and needs, um, highly variable. Um, and, you know, so that's, that's what I really enjoy is the broadness of academic sc scope. Yeah. Um, so if you want to come to work and do the same thing every day and have like a real, and that's totally fine. There's organizations and there's people that are great at that, but United may not be the best, you know, I would say that might, you might want to consider that's not the best fit. Um, uh, and, you know, one thing, you know, I'd say at the same time, I've experienced um, an, a company with 15 people and a company with 350 people. And on the grand scale, I know United is not a big company, but to me, it's a big company because I worked for a company with 15 people for four years. And, um, you know, I think that's been the hardest transition when you're one out of 15. Um, what you do really impacts the company yeah. and you see it. Now, United, what I do and what everybody does impacts the company, but you may not see it because you're just one in a team of, you know, many, many people. And that can be a little bit of a challenge. So you just have to, you know, kind of, you know, learn to stay mechanisms to stay motivated. And a lot of that's just talking with people and and, and so forth. Um, and then, you know, there's with with uh, there can be anarchy. It's a big company. So there has to be some structure. Right. And so that's been a that's been a little bit of a challenge, to be honest with you, that would be no secret to anybody, you know, going from a company with 15 people where anything goes versus a company. And and it's just it's um, a necessary you know, part of, of staying focused um, and, and structured. And and I mean, you're at Purdue and Purdue's a very, very large organization compared to United. So I'm sure that, you know, you understand that the, there's there's. Bureaucracy is not necessarily always a bad thing, right? Um, and it's necessary to help keep us uh, organized. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I love the way that you talk about maybe even that diversity of work and the projects and just your day-to-day -day is so diverse, so varied at what you do. And it keeps you motivated. It keeps you and entertained and and it keeps you you know um as you said not in this mundane doing the same thing over and over again which as you said it could be something for somebody who really loves and they're passionate about one technique and they love doing that well go for it uh, there's a place for that as well uh, but i love the way that you express it that you know, there is a good, you, you have to stay flexible. Is that, is that right? Do, do you have different projects that come in that you say, oh, well, now we need to learn about that type of statistics, or we need to go find somebody that can help us with that type of analysis, because we've never done this type of thing before, or, or, you know, done, done, use that type of program before. Yeah, always. And I'd say it's becoming more free as our um, company in our industry becomes more and more technical. You know the you know the I, the thought that you could have a, uh, an animal scientist that would know how to do it all. Yeah. Um, 30, 40 years ago, I think uh, they wore a lot of hats. But I, we're just you know to the point where we need to you know um, consult uh, with a lot of different you know um, you know uh, individuals with a lot of different intellectual talents. So it's very, very common. And it be, it seems like it's becoming more and more common. You know, the classical example would be our, a lot of our collaborations at United, there's good ones with animal science, but a lot of them are with food science yeah. because a lot of the food scientists contain a unique skill set that we don't have. And it really enhances the collaboration. So, yeah, I think that's the key thing. Um, and then the other thing, you know, that can be a little bit daunting and you may get to this or not, but um, just, you know, knowing, okay, what do I want to focus on this week? What's really important for the company and for our customers and how are we going to get results? So that's how you kind of manage the chaos, in my opinion, with some of this stuff. <laughs> but how, so, I mean, let's, let's do, let's unpack that a little bit because it takes a lot of coordination and it takes a lot of 
uh, forward thinking, but also taking care of the daily uh, aspects. And as you say, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly, all, constant perspective and constant uh, focused on the, the mission ahead. But the mission in three years, five years from now is different than the mission today and different than the week, than the month, and the year. Yeah, I think that's a good point. And and Guy you, Guy Miller used to say, you know, what you did three years ago in research is probably where, you know, the results and the money are coming from today. And I think we all would be good to remember that um, and, and our approach. And so there's a uh, reactive and proactive balance. Um, and to me, like how that's managed is one is we have a really good team, really diverse team. So different, there's different parts. Uh, this gets more into like a leadership thing versus a senior scientist thing. But, um, you know, knowing where that idea or research fits into the pipeline and who's accountable for that, that's part of it. Um, and a big thing from my perspective is, OK, when an idea comes in, there's a lot of ideas. And so how do you know, we work with leadership to funnel this to the pipeline. But like, what's where does this look at the end? Because I think knowing where it's going to what it should look like at the end kind of guides, um, you know, is this merit another email? Does this merit a communication with senior leadership? Or does this maybe just needs to wait for a while, you know, until we're ready? So I think those are the those are the would be the key things. Sure. That's so important. Are there are there particular positions or roles that you're looking to fill now? Are there certain gaps that you're looking Oh, we're we're getting ready for a project that where we might need this or we might need that. Is that is that at all in your purview, or is that happening at a different uh, area in the company? Um, it's it's a little difficult to answer because we're going through a, a reorganization to you know meet our goal of you know scientifically better, which was you know what I mentioned about senior scientist role for me and then some team members that have been more focused. So I say that's challenging to answer right now for our organization, but I think in three six months um, we will be. But there's always a dire need in in our industry for individuals like um, the research associates and support staff that, you know, have a desire to kind of, you know, start um, in an area that like I started out with um, and but is really critical. And there's a critical need for that within our organization. So, um, you know, I'd say that would be like immediately, like if anybody's looking, you know, for research associate uh, type position, I know we have lots of positions open, but, you know, organizationally things are changing in a good way. And so I think there'll be some more clarity on those roles, but only would expect things to continue to diversify in the future. Yeah. And I would think, you know, from lessons learned in your experience, would you recommend somebody who's just finishing their undergrad, who's thinking, I don't know about grad school or not, but I would love to maybe get some experience, do a summer internship with you guys or something like that. Is that something that they should be calling about and seeing if there is potential or even, you know, uh, coming and asking what, how to do it, what's the best advice? Yeah, I think so. I mean, now, uh, really, if you're thinking about summer internships, you need to think of the previous summer. Um, it seems like now everything is like uh, so far out. But yeah, I think that would be a good experience. But just even um, research farm experience, yeah. experience in the lab, even if it's not a formal um, internship or even, uh, you know, experience at the university. There's lots of, traditionally, there's lots of opportunities at Purdue, I'm thinking, um, for students over the summer. And it's, it's not the most glamorous work, but it's really important. And that's uh, in, in terms of your formative experience. And so, um, you know, that's, I would really encourage that. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Nathan, anything that you want to say before we close this off? And I want to thank you so much because, again, you your story has been awesome, has been very much an eye opener and lots of great lessons uh, that, that we can glean from it. But uh, any parting words here of wisdom that you want to you want to uh, leave us with? Oh, I'm not sure about that. I appreciate the opportunity for you to listen to me uh, talk. Uh, 
and the and the opportunity to have the dialogue has been fun. Um, I guess the one thing I would part with uh, to you know follow up a little bit on your last question too is um, you're gonna individuals are gonna have to figure out the situation that works best for them. And so don't be afraid, you know, if it's not the classical path, just do what's best for you and figure out something like what you're really good at and just really excel at it. And you'll differentiate yourself from a lot of the competition. So that would be my, I guess that would be my parting advice. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nathan Horn, Senior Scientist at United Animal Health in beautiful Sheridan, Indiana. Thanks again for being our Pathfinder today. Have a great day, and uh, I hope we get to catch up with you soon. Likewise. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye.